Like I said, it gets me every time I watch it. I've been pastoring a long time, and it still gets me. I think, oh, God, you're still, you're still doing that work in me, and I'm so grateful for that. So, which leads us into the title of the message this morning. I want to talk to you about off and on. I want to talk to you about putting off your old and putting on the new. For a few weeks now, a couple of passages has really been rolling around and pressing me to, to, to speak about this and to teach on it. And they're just a perfect follow-up for what Pastor Trevor talked about last week when he was speaking about, about forgiveness and about how key that is to, to moving forward in our relationship and our walk with Christ. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And we're going to turn and we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and get that out. If not, you know, get your app ready. Look in front of you there. There's a Bible uh, in the pew. If, if you need a Bible and you don't have one, take one of those uh, because we want you to have it. And, and by the way, you're not violating some spiritual holy law if you take notes in your Bible. Uh, but if you take notes in the Bible, it's in the pew there in front of you. Just keep it and take it with you because we don't want other people to read your notes. So uh, hang on to it. So let's jump into Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 32. And I'm going to teach through it in a way that hopefully you have not heard before. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. So understand that, first of all, he's speaking to Christians here when he's writing to these people in Ephesus. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your minds. Reminds me of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's almost the same kind of thought. But it says, renew your minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we see here that we're to take off our old man, and you're going to see a lot in Scripture. Paul talks a lot about this old man and the new man. The, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the old nature and the new nature. I think Pastor Trevor actually mentioned it last week, if you remember that, talking about wouldn't it be nice if the old man would just disappear, but he doesn't because we still live in a fallen state because we live on planet Earth. We're not in heaven yet. And so that day will come when there will be no old man. But right now we're still living it. You notice in this, though, there are these negatives, negative stuff that we have to take off. So negative is putting off, and then positive, the putting on. I'm so grateful that when God made us, and he, you know, we, we're trying to walk the Christian life, he doesn't just say, okay, here's a list of, of do's and don'ts, or here's a list of don'ts. I guess that's the way a lot of people in religion think. They think God has given us a long list of don'ts, and if you don't do those things, you're okay. The good news is, well, the Holy Spirit does talk to us about, you know, that's probably not a good plan. But God always gives us a replacement for the negative. So there are these negatives, yes, but there's also these incredible positives, which we're going to look at as, as we work through this passage, and that's really what we're trying to do. But notice it says, when you think about your old self, it's corrupted by deceitful desires. You know, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceptive, and a deceiver, and, and the evil one is a deceiver. So he's working through our spirit. He's working through the old nature to create these deceptive, deceitful desires in our hearts. So what does it look like to put off your old self and to put on the new self? There are five illustrations that the Apostle Paul is going to give us here. And um, we're going to see what it means in these five illustrations of what it means to take off the old man and to put on the new. So let's dive into it. Look at verse 20, 25. It says, therefore, each of you must. It doesn't say you might want to think about this. It says, Christians, each of you must, here's number one, put off falsehood. Is that a negative or a positive? 
not a trick question. Is that a negative or is that a positive? It's a negative. The, the falsehood is a negative. And speak truthfully to your neighbor, we, we are all members of one body. Negative or positive? That's a positive. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So, is letting the sun go down while you're still angry, in other words, holding a grudge, pastor's message last week on forgiveness, is that a negative thing or a positive thing? It's a negative thing. Don't sin by holding a grudge. Do not give the devil a foothold. They say, well, wait a minute, where's the positive? The positive isn't mentioned here. It, it's, instead, it's implied and is spoken of further in the text, but it's the core of this text. And you'll see what it is here in just a second. And it's this principle of forgiveness and reconciliation. It says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't sin, the negative part, because you're harboring resentment that's going to eat you alive, as Pastor Trevor talked about last week. So anyone who has been stealing must, there's number three, steal no longer. So stealing, negative or positive? It's a negative, it's obvious, isn't it? But must work doing something useful with his own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Wow. It's interesting to me that Paul states the primary purpose of our work is to be able to give it back. You know, I, I love the fact that, that Colleen, my, that my wife, is so, is, is embracing Operation Christmas Child so much. And, and I'm so grateful that she's still teaching swimming because we would be broke because we have so many Operation Christmas Child things around the house. CVS and the other places are calling her now and saying, hey, the items are going on sale. And she runs over there and people are just giving her stuff that's, I mean, brand new stuff for OCC. But I was thinking, she's got this heart of wanting just to give and give and give back to others. And that's just, that's a cool thing. So this idea of working so we're useful and can give, positive or negative? That's a positive thing as opposed to stealing. All right, then number four. What am I? I love this passage, and I wish I could apply it all the time. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Negative or positive? It's a negative. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, not your needs. When you get in an argument, you're trying to satisfy your need or, or the person you're talking with. <laughs> We're always trying to, I'm going to show you it says building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen so you're trying to spill grace into the life of people that you're in conversation with is that a positive thing or a negative thing that's positive and then it goes on it says and do not grieve the holy spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption what does it mean that means that when we receive Christ as Christians, we get the Holy Spirit. God promises it. It permanently indwells every believer. It doesn't go and come. Wouldn't it be nice if it would? You sit down, you want to watch something on TV, and it's, it's a little racy. And so you think, Holy Spirit, why don't you go outside and play for a while? Let me stay in here. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit lives in us permanently takes up residence, and empowers us to be what God wants us to be. And so that's an important thing for us to, to, to keep in mind, for us to remember all the time. So that's what it means when it says we're sealed until the day of redemption. That means until God calls us home. So all these negatives and a whole pile more of things that aren't listed here grieve the Holy Spirit. And I would bet most of us who have been walking in Christ for a length of time know those things that grieve the Holy Spirit. We feel it inside. I know I do. It's like, oh. It's, it's almost like he was reacting when the chisel. And that's, that's sort of God's chisel at work. It's like, oh, God. 
oh, I can't believe I did that again. I'm so sorry. Man. You know, and that's it's grieving the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing that we need to get about that. Rather than feel guilty and feel like we're junk, we need to recognize that, that those things are what breaks God's heart. And his desire is for us to come out of that stuff. So you just have to see God's chisel when you knock all these negative things out of our lives. And here's number five then. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. I mean, that's a whole bunch, isn't it? Is that, is that a negative or is that a positive? Come on, guys. Is that negative or is that positive? Those are all negatives, aren't they? Get rid of all this stuff. You know, it was the last time that bitterness and rage and anger or brawling or slander and malice seemed like a positive thing. It's a negative. Then it goes on. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Pastor Trevor's message last week. As. As what? As Christ. Or just as in Christ God forgave you. When he said don't tell me about sacrifice. I suffer for my, my own son. Do you think you hold a right, a right to hold a grudge and bitterness towards someone? Think about what Christ did for you. You talk about forgiveness. You talk about grace and mercy. What God shows to us is completely undeserved. That's the positive. That's the heart of what Pastor Trevor talked about last week. So here in this text, we have five examples of putting off your old self and putting on the new self. And I never noticed this before. And, and uh, Pastor Peter, if you're watching this, I do not know whether this is actually sound Greek or not. Uh, but I know that as I looked at other translations, I thought there was a reason that these translators did this in this particular text. It says, put off your old self. But then it says, put on the new self. Now, I, I don't know, as I said, whether, whether this is a big deal or not. But here's, here's how I picture that. Say, so, hey, the old man, that old stuff, that's all yours. That's your junk. That's not how I created you to be. You know, the self-loathing that you're involved in, that's not how I, how I created you to be. You know, the anger that you ha harbor all the time, that's not how I created you to be. That's yours. You know, the jealousy that you feel all the time, that's yours. The insecurity that you feel all the time, that's yours. I want to chisel that away. I want to put on the new man. The new man is all about him. The old man is all about you. The old man is your junk. So he says, I want you to put on the new man. And so I, I just, I love that particular uh, aspect of it. Take a look. Um, John, throw up that next slide. So this is what I just taught you. If you want to get your camera out and take a picture of it, you can see the five things and you can, you can follow along and that will give you uh, the text as it was. So what's our motive then in putting off our old and putting on the new? If you look back at verse 25, we're going to start walking through several of these motivations for us. For we are all members, what does that say? Of one body. We're all parts interconnected as the body of Christ. If, if you imagine linking arms, or if you may, you've heard the illustrations of some of the, the, the conifers that have their roots at ground and they all intertwine and so the, the forest is all knit together as one tight body. That's the way the body of Christ should be. It's far from that in the body of Christ in most places, 
but we are all members of one body. Have you ever, um, have you ever stubbed a toe and had it hurt the entire body so badly that you couldn't function anymore? Well, that's our illustration of that. When one of us hurts, we should all, in a sense, feel that hurt. That's why the scripture says, uh, grieve with those who grieve and rejoice with those who rejoice, or mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. So we're all members of one body. Then it goes on, it says in verse 27, don't give the devil a foothold. So because we're members of one body, you give the devil a foothold. Do you know that, that sometimes our mess ups can literally get in the way of what God wants to do in an entire community, an entire body of Christ? Don't give the devil a foothold. You know, you, you, you come into an organization and, you, and you, start, you start whispering and gossiping. And all of a sudden, the whole body of Christ just becomes cancerous. Don't give the devil a foothold. Verse 28, it goes on, it says, um, you may have something to share with those in need. So the next motivation is because we want to be able to share and give gener and be generous. And that's not just talking about, that's not about money. Ah, yeah, that's all about money. That's all you guys ever ask about. No, this is about being a Christ follower who has compassion for the person next to you. And then next in verse 29, what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. In other words, that you will be a grace dispenser, that you'll be an exhorter, you'll be a cheerleader for each other as you move forward. And then verse 30 gives us the motive that I think wraps all of this up. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not getting rid of the negatives and putting on the new, and doing those spiritual disciplines that cause you to be strengthened in the new nature, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And that gets in the way of what God wants us to be. And then the qualifier behind all of this, I've already mentioned that is, just as in God, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Because we have been redeemed. Our motivation for living in the new nature is because of what Christ has done for us. The ultimate sacrifice. Now, there's something about absolutely astounding about this whole text. And in every other text that you find where Paul is talking about the old man and the new man, Paul doesn't say, oh, by the way, you guys remember how back in the Old Testament it said, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not. Never once does he refer to the law. He doesn't refer back to the Old Testament at all here. What's he doing? He's putting Christian ethics, our behavior, our attitudes, our motivation, he's putting on a whole different level, on a whole different plane. The law is here. The law is like the mirror. It shows you you need to clean up. You know, we used to use this illustration all the time. You go in, you look at your face in the mirror, and you notice know it's got dirt all over it. So you rip the mirror off the wall, and you start to scrub your face with the mirror, right? No. What do you do? You get a washcloth, and you begin to wash the dirt away. That's what Christ does. The law is that mirror. It's, ah, I need a cleansing agent. Some people go, oh, I need a cleansing agent. I'm going to get better, or I'm going to get more holy. It doesn't work. The only thing that's a cleansing agent that takes that dirt away is Jesus. And so Paul doesn't mention the law at all. He said, this is on a whole different level. Our motivation does not come from a list of rules or laws. Oh, I wish churches would get that. You've been set free from the power of sin and bondage. And he wants you to live in grace and mercy and enjoy this life that he's created for you. 
So our motivation is not because of a bunch of laws. Our motivation is because we've put on the new man and God's spirit's taken up permanent residence in us. You know, you think about, <clears throat> you know, I, I know several of you do. I get up and go to the gym. I try to go every day. Do I love going to the gym? I hate going to the gym some days. I mean, some days it's like, oh, I don't want to do this. And, and people say this all the time. Listen to your body. Nonsense. My body tries to talk me out of doing it every time I start to work out. What do you think is going to happen when you decide, I need to start getting into the Word of God more. I need to start being obedient to what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. Do you think the old nature is going to say, yeah, that's a great idea? Or is the evil going to start whispering, who do you think you are? <laughs> you can't do that. Just, just like Tommy in, this, in the video. You know, he looks in the mirror. What did he say he saw? He saw this broken little kid who felt miserable. So begin to exercise the new nature, the new man. Let me read a couple other passages for you real quick, and uh, we're moving along here pretty well, so we're going we're gonna to get through this on time. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, I'm not going to do this with a lot of commentary. Just let it sink in. For Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Meaning Jesus. Because Adam sinned, he died for him, he died for all of us. But he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So what's our motivation for living? Jesus. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The ones who regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creation has come. You're a new creature. Stop thinking of yourself like that old creature. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is, this is how to take those principles that, that Pastor gave us last week and how to, how to carry them out to the next level. And that is to be reconciled. To God, to man, to each other. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Meaning, helping people understand how they can be reconciled to God. For that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. If you have a religious background, you've been afraid all of your life that God is counting all of your sins and he's holding that against you and he's just going to knock you silly one of these days. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. So our goal is to be reconcilers. We're therefore Christ ambassadors. You see yourself as an ambassador? You're an ambassador for Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us, as if God is, is using our lips for his purposes, our actions for his purposes. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And in this passage, if you ever wonder whether salvation is clear, look at this. God made him who had no sin, Jesus. To be sin for us, he took our sin on himself, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our junk. In fact, he looks over at Christ and he sees it on Jesus. Because Jesus bore our sin for us on the cross. Such a powerful passage. That's how we need to see ourselves. Therefore, 
This is, in, this is another passage, by the way. This is in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. One of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture about our relationship and then about Christ's relationship to us. Listen to it. Therefore, if you have any encouragement, that's the positive, for being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, another positive, if any common sharing in the spirit, that's a positive, if any tenderness and compassion, another positive, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, another positive, have the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Again, positives. Do not or do nothing out of selfish ambition, negative, or vain conceit, negative. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Don't look to your own interest, negative. But each of you on the interest of others. Care about the needs of others. In your relationship with one another, have the main, same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just say, I'm not going to the cross, forget that, that's not going to happen. He became our savior, but rather he made himself nothing by taking on the nature of a servant. This passage is called the kenosis, the emptying. Jesus, God in human form, left all of heaven behind, all of his authority, privileges, rights, everything, and took on the form of a lowly servant. So being taken on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death, or obedient to death rather, even death on the cross. He took on death so you didn't have to. He died in your place. Again, the verse we just read, he's made him into no sin to be sin for us, that we might, be, might become the righteousness of God in him. He died in our place. So as Tommy, in this kid guy's clip, said, we need to continue to yield to God's spirit as he chips away that old man. And that chipping will last a lifetime. When the new man is fully alive, when the new man is working in us, when the new man is directing ourselves, we can say, as Tommy said, I am God's masterpiece. And you are God's masterpiece. And I guarantee you there are people sitting in here right now that go, no, I don't feel much like God's masterpiece. That was Tommy's problem, wasn't it? I want to share a quick story with you, and uh, I'm, I'm, I was going to do this, but I, I, I think we need this. So this is because I, following up on what Pastor Trevor said last week and what we've talked about here about new nature, and, and one of the illustrations Pastor Trevor gave last week made me think of this. But I want to tell you a little bit about Corey Ten Boom. How many of you remember who Corey Ten Boom was? Corey Ten Boom, family rescued many, many, many Jews when Germany was, was taking control, the Nazis were taking control, and ultimately, uh, Corey's in, almost entire family perished uh, because of that. But Corey was able to survive, and then she became a Christian speaker, author, uh, and, and an amazing lady, one of my heroes. But she writes in a book, and that, it, was, it was 1947, and I'd come from Holland to, de to defeat Germany with the message that God forgives it was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander, mind, uh, a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where the forgiveness of sins were thrown, that God just cast them in the sea. 
When we confess our sins, I said, God creates the, or casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I can't, I can't find scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign out there that says, no fishing allowed, meaning don't take your sins back. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. And that's when I saw him working his way forward against the others. Imagine people are starting to leave and somebody is walking down toward Corey Tenbaum. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a cap with skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking past this man, naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath, between her parchment garment. Betsy, how thin you were. That place was Ravensbrook. And the man who was making his way forward had been a guard one of the most cruel guards. Now he was in front of me, his hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that you, that as you say, all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among the thousands of women? But I remembered him. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me from the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, for our life. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? As I stood there, I whose sins had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It had been many seconds that, I st that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we, forgive, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And still I stood there with coldest clutching my heart. But Forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. That's a great phrase. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the outstretched, the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulders and raced down my arms, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, 
we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even then I realized it was not my love. I had tried and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. So see, that's what the old man doesn't want to have happen. The new man wants to empower you. He wants you to be able to look in God's mirror and say, I'm God's masterpiece. But when you allow junk like unforgiveness, like refusing to reconcile, it keeps us from being that masterpiece that God has tried to carve. I want you to do something for a minute. I want you to just use this cross up here as your, as your mirror, God's mirror. I want you to look at it. And I want you to say blank and use your name is God's masterpiece. Okay, I'm going to count to three and I want you to do it. Everybody use your name here. Ready? One, two, three. Tony is God's masterpiece. Now, we're going to do it again because I think you said it like Tommy said it the first time. I want you to look at it. I want you to believe that that image that you're seeing of you is God's masterpiece. Ready? One, two, three. Do you believe that? That's what he wants you to believe. The evil one wants you to believe anything and everything but that. He's made you for a purpose. He loves you with an unconditional love. So you don't let God down. He said that. I love his words. You didn't let me down. You were never holding me up. You are his masterpiece. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for your love. <laughs> Lord, I'm so grateful that your love is unconditional. And Father, I'm, I'm so grateful that we can look into your mirror and you can literally see us reflecting back as the one created in your image. Dear Lord, I thank you that your love is always there for us. I thank you that your forgiveness is complete and absolute. I pray for any here this morning that, that perhaps for the very first time you realize how much God loves you he desires to have a relationship with you so much so that he sent his own son to die in your place so that you might experience his forgiveness and his mercy he has made him into no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in you if you don't know that would you just say in your heart right now not some magic word or magic formula but it's actually accepting that forgiveness for me. I believe that God loves me. And I put all of my trust in Him. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for eternal love. talk to those of us now that have been a part of the family of God for a while. Because we all know that battle that exists between the old and the new man. Would you say, Pastor, 
Jesus. I, I just need you to remember me in prayer. In fact, I just want to lift my hand up before God because I'm tired of the old man living my life. And I just, uh, I wanted to start as an affirmation before him. I want to raise my hand and say, God, I want to walk in the newness of your spirit. I want to walk, I want to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Living. I want to be open to letting God's chisel work in me. And I just need to confess that now this morning. Ourselves viewed as God sees us. Maybe there's some here this morning that say, Yeah, Pastor, I'll read you help for that. I feel like a piece of junk. And I just need to see myself as God sees me. Could you slide your hand up and down? Let me, let me remember you in prayer. Oh. Precious person, <laughs> understand. This is me.